Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Renew Adelaide Branch's May meeting. My name is Alan Strickland. I'm the Adelaide Branch convener. And I acknowledge the traditional owners on the uh, various lands on which we meet. Now, tonight's theme is electric vehicles and energy networks. And our presenter is Greg McGarvey, who is the founder and the managing director of electric vehicle manufacturer ACV. Hi, Greg. And with a background in marine biology, Greg's passion is to lower pollution and he promotes electric vehicles as the future of efficient transportation. And in the energy sector, he's promoted, uh, he's worked in utility scale solar and, uh, and storage, also low, uh, low energy electric lighting as well as EVs. So he's not only actively involved in constructing EVs, but he's got a keen interest in the energy system that provide uh, that powers them, and how the two might be best integrated with renewable energy to boot. So it sends your questions during the presentation via the Q and A button, and I'll present them to Greg at the end of his talk. And this session will be recorded and made available via the Renew uh, Adelaide branch web page. So please welcome Greg. Thanks everyone. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I hope you all become EV owners down the track. And that tonight's event is really just to describe what um, how we started and the importance of EVs. It's not so much for transport, but energy management, communication, and a much cleaner lifestyle and a better future for our grandchildren. And that's that's my focus with um, ACE Electric Vehicle Group, ACE standing for Australian Clean Energy. And uh, we're very fortunate that our partners, we've got some of the cleverest partners globally, and they're happy to help us out here in Australia. So we're doing everything possible to get our business set up and operating. Um, I guess one uh, underscore of that is that Already, before we've actually opened the factory doors, there's enough people with confidence in what we've got for them uh, that we've got over two and a half billion dollars worth of vehicles reserved, and that's that's really encouraging. Anyway, I suppose I should pass back to Alan. Let him ask a few questions. And Alan, I'm not sure, but if people want to butt in with a question during the talk, um, it might be easier than letting them wait till the end. But that's up to you. Yes, well, if uh, people do have questions as, as anyone's speaking, uh, just use the Q&A button and I'll put them uh, through to Greg. Now, you've set established ACE electric vehicles uh, about four years ago. Can you just take us through how you inspired to, to do this? I mean, everyone says, why don't we make electric vehicles in Australia and then does nothing? and uh, then the next thing is, why don't we make electric vehicles in the old car plants, such as Holden's, and then nothing happens. So can you take us through the, uh, the light bulb moment, how you went about deciding what you needed to, to set up an industry and how you, how you set it up, designed the cars and the current? Yeah, look, that, that's fairly easy. I'll do a quick uh, history. Uh, the reason we got into electric vehicles, my business partner and I had always been involved in energy management and um, we pivoted towards solar and then we are talking with one of, the, one of the development partners in solar and said, look, we're a little bit interested in EVs. And he introduced us to Dr. Charles Kung. Uh, Dr. Charles Kung is Taiwanese, a nuclear engineer. Uh, he uh, was key manager of one of the leading autos in Taiwan that manufactured components for Toyota. Uh, he's no slouch, very clever man, and he is also the chief engineer for the high-speed rail that was built by the Taiwanese and Japanese that runs the length of Taiwan. He partnered with Gerhard Kerr, and Gerhard's uh, German, obviously, from Stuttgart, and um, he was involved with Ernst Tomka in the design and build uh, of the very first smart cars, and most people know the smart cars are a nice, tiny little vehicle that Mercedes now own. Uh, Gerhard, we consider as the leader in what we call 100% composite technology. To put that in simple terms, 
Our vehicle is built of similar materials to the Boeing Dreamliner, assembled in a similar way. Uh, when we say 100% composite, if you want to put it in simple terms, it's plastic and uh, it's glued together. And with that, uh, that capability, of course, it has extraordinary strength, uh, durability and lightness. And um, how it came about that we decided we'd do this in Australia was, as I said, introduced to Charles by uh, one of the development partners in solar. Uh, we met with Charles and he said, oh, yes, OK, well, you better prove yourselves to me. And um, so we've spent the last over five years now building this up. We had Charles come out to Australia, visit and talk with various governments and um, it's been a long, hard haul getting there. Uh, as you know, government's not overly enthusiastic about new initiatives in Australia. And um, I think part of the problem was they considered us as an auto. We're far from it. Our, our business is energy management and software. It just happens that the bonus is you have a very inexpensive vehicle that's nimble, a great pleasure to drive and clean on the environment. And I suppose I'll, I'll take a pause there, Alan, and let you ask the next, next question. Yes, it was about the uh, the construction. It's um, you've got a background in marine biology, and it's exoskeletal. Is it? Do I have this right? It's sort of Monaco construction. <laughs> it doesn't have a chassis or a framework. No, no, you're, you're partly there. It's um, the the key part of our vehicle is its skeleton, or what I call a skeleton. The motor industry usually calls it a, um, a chassis, and it, our, our skeleton is made of equivalent of 14 bones chemically welded together. When they're assembled, they're two to three times stronger than the equivalent in metal. Uh, they're very light. You can lift the um, skeleton up by one hand, you know, one end of it. And um, then what it is is clad or sc has skin put on it, which is at the moment is an ABS plastic. But we've got a uh, research agreement with the University of Queensland and they're working on turning that plastic from petroleum based to nature-based, so we'll be using hemp nanoparticles and bioresin uh, for the plastics in future. And our, our, our whole objective with the vehicle is that it really lasts your lifetime. And um, people get bored with vehicles. Uh, so what we do is uh, you can change the skins after five years, have a different looking vehicle, as long as it doesn't impact the um, ANCAP rating. Uh, you can start with the basic vehicle and a few years I say no I want a vehicle that'll drive itself and so we put in a plug and play autonomous system or you might say no I want a vehicle it's like my horse it looks at it, it, it talks to me well we can set that up we can set a vehicle up with a personality and um, it's, it's the skeleton itself should last 20 30 years or longer unless you really have a very bad accident and the whole the whole concept behind our vehicle is recyclable as much as possible. Uh, there are limitations on the batteries, but I think as time goes by, from 80% recycling, it will just get up and up to you know, full recycling. So the drivetrain <coughs> can be moved from skin to skin uh, or upgraded as new technology emerges. Yes, drivetrain, batteries, you know, just about... And, and we're looking at the vehicle more as a plug and play solution. And um, and if you want to really identify the vehicle with anything, it's basically a mobile phone uh, with wheels and seats and a big battery. And it has all the capabilities your mobile ha phone has. Uh, now, a question comes through from Andrew. Why is the ute so much cheaper than the urban? Uh, I was just going to go on to ask you to run through the range and uh, prices and, and features. But I'll, I'll just give you Andrew's question. Um, why is the ute so much cheaper than the urban? The urban appears pitched as the new VW. People's uh, wagon, I'd love to switch from a petrol car, but can't justify the cost of any new existing uh, new EVs. That's a fair question and it's a common, common question. Uh, I think our vehicles are probably a little bit cheaper than the average run of vehicles in the market, and that's our entry point. Uh, once we've got volume, we expect the prices to drop even further, but you have to start somewhere. 
And the, the question with the ute being less expensive than the urban, uh, one, it's got less bones um, and it's got less components to it. You know, the, the ute is a basically open tray. Everything else is very similar. The drivetrain, uh, battery system, um, and you know, the computing system, that's all the same. It's really the difference in pricing is effectively the uh, extra materials used and the extra parts to the skeleton. Hope that answers the question. And the pricing, uh, we think is pretty fair. The ute's around $26,000 and um, the urban's 29 and the, uh, sorry, the cargo, the van is 29 and the urban's 35. What we're doing is purposely selling our vehicles the same as you buy a petrol vehicle. When you buy a petrol vehicle, you don't uh, buy five years of fuel with it. So we're saying rent or lease the battery. And that by doing that, any troubles with the battery or need to upgrade to a larger battery, it's just a simple swap. It doesn't prevent, of course, people buying the whole vehicle with the battery. Right. I so hope I answered your question, Andrew. Yes, and you also answered uh, Mark's question. Um, are the composite materials recyclable? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not going to pretend it's easy. Some of them are harder than others uh, because a composite is it's a mix of carbon fibre and other, other, other materials as well. It's not just pure carbon fibre that has um, crashing implications and fracture problems. It's a mix that uh, provides all the safety collapsing features that you have in uh, other vehicles. Right. Um, now, have you got, you've got some slides of your, uh, your range. Could, you, could we have a look at the, the various vehicles and some yeah. idea of the, um, uh, um, the, the range and carrying capacity? I'll put up the um, cargo first. Uh, this, this is a, the cargo. Um, it's designed, it's computer controlled, it's it deliberately designed as an urban last mile city vehicle. Nothing else. Uh, we have other vehicles coming along down the track that will be open road and um, have a different performance characteristic. Its uh, payload is 500 kilo and about three cubic metres in the back. Uh, the, Great advantage with it is that uh, with the battery, you'll have a power point so you can run your tools uh, directly off the vehicle and uh, lighting, sound systems, coffee machine if you want. Um, the vehicle itself is just over 1,000 kilo, uh, pretty light. And um, the range, best way to quote range really is it uses between 12 and 14 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometres. And if you put that into uh, uh, a cost to around about three dollars sixty per hundred kilometres, which of course is quite different to your petrol vehicle. Running solar at home, of course, it's a different thing again. So this is designed as a, an about town vehicle um, with overnight. Typically, would be charged overnight. Isn't right. going to do long distances, but um, can carry a fair a fair load. Yeah. Well. The range of batteries, we, you know, the, the standard vehicle comes with a 30 kilowatt hour battery, and that gives it a range just for 200 ki uh, kilometres and a bit less if you really load it up or thrash it. Um, and then we go up to 60 kilowatt hour battery. But for people that just want the vehicle as their own handy weekend vehicle, um, they'll find they'll probably never ever use the range of it. And, um, you know, the majority of people out there now probably only fill their vehicles once a week or once a fortnight. And uh, they have to hunt around, find a petrol station at a good price to do that. The advantage with our electric vehicle is you take it home, plug it in, just like your mobile phone. And uh, if you've done 50 kilometres during the day, you'll need three hours, uh, equivalent of a, a two bar radiator running, and your vehicle will be fully charged. Uh, if you've run it empty, of course, it'll be overnight. But the beauty of it is every morning you get up, you don't have to look at the petrol gauge, it's full while you go and do your business. Typically from a 10 amp supply, you wouldn't be uh, putting in anything, um, th uh, 30 amp supply or three phase or anything like that for a typical user. Uh, well, look, the, the, 
the the best, uh, uh, and I'll get on to our uh, $5 billion grant and why we've got that in a moment, but our vehicle is designed as I'll just plug into a PowerPoint. Uh, of course, if you've got a caravan style PowerPoint at home, it's better because you can charge faster. Uh, it has a capability if you're downtown and you need to charge off a DC charger, you can do that as well at a faster rate. Uh, it's, uh, but we, we're designed a vehicle around human behavior and the majority of people, and when I say majority, over 80% plus charge at home. We've got one of our partners out of the UK has had a Tesla for three years, it's charged at three times at a commercial charge point. Other times it's just charged at home, does his drive, comes home, plugs it back in. Right. Um, now, a question about your um, your market intentions. Per um, personally, I think we, we need more small EVs, just like the three current ACE models. However, Australians are mostly buyers of large vehicles. What percentage of the overall Australian small car market are you initially aiming for, as well as? Uh... Well, look, we're, we're we're aiming for, and there are a lot of people around that love the Subaru Brumby, and our Ute is just marginally bigger than Subaru Brumby, and um, in fact, it's been we've had more interest in it and uh, it and the cargo than the urban, of course, and I think it's just every every person's dreamed over of Ute. It's easy, cheap, and uh, won't rust. And um, uh, we're, at, we're looking at no percentage here in Australia other than that when we're in full production, we would expect about 30% of local sales uh, and the rest offshore. We've already got agreements we're developing up offshore um, through the uh, smart, smart pack that we're producing the vehicle in. Right, thank you. Uh, talking of models, I always thought a uh, mini Moog Californian would make a, a great electric vehicle with the batteries and those um, chass chassis members down the side. I think some people have already done that. Really? <laughs> what sort of um, honour? Can you explain the energy management side of things with ACE? Uh, yes, if I will. Look, uh, that, that, uh, we see the energy management system in our vehicle as the heart of the vehicle and the core of what we're doing. Uh, the system we've got in place, uh, we know it's a first, global first. Uh, we we're told by some uh, people in the, or by energy people in the UK that they should have done it five years ago, but they just, the bureaucracy prevented that sort of happening. Uh, we've been fortunate here in Australia that I guess it's timing as well. Uh, we put together a proposal and the proposal is that our vehicle We'll plug in every power point in Australia becomes a charge point. And the way we do that is the vehicle has an onboard um, charger, smart charger, and an onboard smart meter. So in effect, it's like your house on wheels. And the, the vehicle is uh, built for the energy it uses. And there's a whole lot of other things, of course, can be done when you've got a smart meter on board a vehicle. And the other critical thing, or the great advantage is the vehicle, is one, if the power goes out at home, you run your house off for power. And typical house, if you're a little bit careful with your energy use, you should get up to three days of energy out of a vehicle. And well, we all know that very rare that you have more than a, a half a day of power outages in Australia because our system grid's pretty good. Um, then if you've got, um, say, a natural disaster like happened in Gippsland with the fires, uh, if there are a lot of EVs around, they could be... Um, basically called up as a swarm, go down there, plug in, provide light, communication, all the essentials as uh, everyone sort of tries to recover. Um, and we see that as a, a, a bonus as well. The other great benefit of the vehicle is that um, uh, we're partnering with uh, some telcos. We're also partnering with um, retail energy companies and visual artificial intelligence companies. A uh, bit unusual for a vehicle company, but that's what we're doing because they're bringing to the table some great opportunities um, in terms of energy management. And when I say energy management, the vehicle can be supplying energy to the grid. Uh, so if there's a power outage somewhere, uh, all the vehicles can be called up through our energy mesh and release energy. Now they might decide, the owner of the vehicle might decide, no, I'm not going to release my energy unless I get paid such and such a, 
a kilowatt hour for it. So, you know, the um, algorithms in the grid and the grid management will say, well, uh, he's too expensive. We don't want his power, but we'll get the neighbours next door that hasn't got a, a floor, floor price on his energy. And the other opportunity coming up, which is already um, uh, evident in the South Australian markets, there's a bit chances where there's too much energy during the day. And rather than turning everything off, it'd be far better to charge batteries and even pay people to charge their batteries just to save the cost of switching things off and all the other drama that accompanies it. So our vehicle will be bi-directional uh, and has a lot of benefits by bringing that to the grid. It's actually a mobile energy management system. Right, you've just answered the, the second half of uh, Tom's question. Are you, are you um, reading from the Q&A section or do, do you want to just take, um, go through this and answer to, um, to your own pace or do you want me to read them, read them out? No, I'll, I'll, I'll open them up and have a look. I didn't. Ah. Okay, so that's Tom. I hope I answered his questions well. Yep, I think so. And then Ian, what sort of range penalty does one see on EV, not the ACVs, when using climate control aircon? That's a fair question. Um, and I'll probably dodge that a little bit and say, Ian, it'll be the same effect that it would have on a petrol vehicle if you run your air conditioner at full bore. Um, our, uh, the aircon in our vehicles will be a very efficient one and it'll probably draw about one and a half kilowatts. So you've got a 30 kilowatt battery, uh, you can do the sums. But what I found really good was uh, when I was in the vehicle myself uh, doing phone calls, I had the aircon switched on, no motor running. And uh, so it was nice and quiet and uh, very comfortable. Uh, then I've got a question here from EC. Uh, I'm not sure EC, I'm a marine biologist, remember that. What do you mean by ready mode? Maybe if you could put uh, amplify on that and I'll answer that for you. Uh, Diane, what type, battery type are you using? Good question, that's easy to answer. Uh, what we're using are lithium phosphate. Uh, currently they're sort of the most stable and uh, we've got the best reputation in the market, but we've also got uh, the advantage that our vehicle is designed as an EV and down the track, if there's a change in battery chemistry or battery type, uh, you know, if, uh, capacitors and other things come in, we can fit them to the vehicle. And one good point I should make about the batteries is that uh, with our batteries, you can buy the batteries first, install them in your house with the full management system, take advantage of some of the trading opportunities um, and running your house off a battery uh, and the cheaper energy prices. And then when your vehicle comes, it's just a matter of putting the battery into the vehicle, a 10, 15 minute operation. Um, yeah, we, we think that's a, a benefit as well. Have you had any thoughts about replaceable battery packs? Uh, I think there's attempts to come up with standards and uh, standard methodologies for, for them, or do you think with uh, recharging times, uh, they're not going to be useful for... Um, for... The, the battery, well, Taiwan's a bit of a leader in that area uh, with their, their scooters in, in, in particular. Um, they've got battery packs everywhere, but they've, they've developed their own standard. And so effectively, you ride your scooter up to, it can be a, um, a 411 or 711 and grab a battery, swap it over and away you go. Um, we only see perhaps in our series four, that's the next one called our transformer. Uh, it will have exchangeable battery packs, but it's more focused on perhaps um, fleet where you have a, a station uh, at your depot where the batteries are charging. You just come in, swap the batteries over and off you go. Uh, the same thing of course would apply for long distance if you had charging stations a long way, but. There will really need, there should be standards. The way, there aren't at the moment. And there is a danger, I guess, if the standards aren't developed, that you end up with a, the video problems that we had years ago, you know, between beta and uh, 
and all the different type of video formats. Mm. But uh, our focus really isn't on swappable batteries. The, it has been tried before. <clears throat> uh, NEO are doing it now in China quite successfully, but uh, they did it in Israel and turned out to be a bit of a disaster because of the, the infrastructure needed to support it. And um, yeah. Now, I did see some other Q&As too, I better answer. Robin is next. Yeah, uh, Robin, can we see the rest of the range where the batteries sit in the vehicles? Um, probably, Robin, I'm a bit of an amateur with the, the um, um, slides on this. I don't think I've got one showing where the battery is, but if you send, if you subscribe on our website and just say, Greg sends through that information, I can send that straight through to you. And our website's easy enough. It's just www.ace-ev.com.au. In fact, if you just look up Google, Google for Ace Electric Vehicles, you should find it. Uh, and then we've got anonymous. If there's any benefit of having solar panels on the roof of the car, there is, but um, marginal. Uh, and we've got an announcement coming on later this year about um, solar. Um, we were talking with the University of New South Wales and you know, they were indicating that you could probably pick up with very, very good solar uh, up to 53 kilometres a day. So, you know, out, out from the sun. What types of chart? Yeah, CCS2, Mark, and um, normal PowerPoint, PowerPoint plug. Okay, yeah, got it. Thanks, Electric Car Australia. Um, yes, now it does, it needs to do the same thing uh, because you've got the 12 volt instrument battery that uh, runs off the main, the main battery. Uh, not with a 20 foot, and, and to, yes, you're correct. In terms of the 240 volt for the battery, that's not needed. All right. So I think, yeah, I think I've answered most of the questions now, Alan. So if you've got any other questions. Yeah. Um, okay. I appreciate Greg is the, has just come up. But a quick one on um, uh, solar uh, charging from uh, your home solar system. Cars out out and about at the uh, height of the day when the uh, the sun is at its highest. Yep. The obvious uh, to me method would then be that you have a separate set of batteries at home to then charge the transfer the charge to the car at night. Is that um, is that the only way it can be done? That's that's probably the logical way. Um, the other thing, of course, is. If you're out and about, you're probably not driving the car all the time anyway, so you should have it plugged in. And so um, a second battery would be the ideal setup. Right. And Greg's question, can I buy a CCS2 charger for my converted car? Could you give us a, an idea of the current handle and capacity of C, CCS2? Yeah, yeah. Now, what is the turning circle? Uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> I can't give you the measurement of the turning circle, but it almost turns in its own length uh, because it doesn't have a motor in the middle to stop the wheels turning. And uh, future vehicles we've got uh, will turn in their own length. So that was for anonymous attendee. Uh, Greg of Darwin, can I buy your CCS charger for my converted car? Well, look, what will happen, Greg, is uh, down the track, you'll be able to buy our white label device, the bi-directional charger, fit it to your car. And you'll have uh, the full capability of just plugging into a normal PowerPoint or um, charging at a, uh, anywhere where they've got CCS2. Have that answered your question, Greg? And um, anonymous attendee, do you expect the trend, really 80% plus charging at home to hold true? EV scale, I think it will. Um, there's a lot of noise out there about how EVs are going to collapse the grid. But as I said, the average person globally, and that's the way, 
travels about 38 kilometres a day. But let's say they travel 50 kilometres a day. If that was in our vehicle, you would use six to seven kilowatt hours of energy. And anyone familiar with a three, two bar radiator knows that that's a two kilowatt radiator. So it's effectively plugging a radiator in for three hours, which is your car. If the grid can't handle a two bar radiator running for three hours uh, in all the houses, uh, we've got a little bit of a worry. And I think Australia's grid is good enough for that. And there are other ways of managing, of course. Uh, but just to compare, the average in Japan is only 13 kilometres a day. So I would expect most people are lazy and I'll say, I'll just plug the car in at home and it'll be full next morning. I won't worry about it. And with the management system on it, you know, the car might decide it'll charge at very low rates, uh, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning. How much are the batteries? Uh, where and where, I'll better answer next one. Where, uh, uh, where will these vehicles be made? At the moment, we're looking at South Australia. Uh, we've been advised by some of our investor partners from the UK and elsewhere that we should be moving offshore, but I want to do this in Australia. So I'm a bit stubborn and we'll keep at it. Um, and when they'll be made, uh, we're taking reservations now and uh, I've promised foolishly one of our first people to reserve a vehicle that she'll be driving her vehicle out October 22nd this year. So uh, we're going to do it, but realistically, I think the majority of people could expect that their vehicles will be delivered um, probably middle of next year on, maybe a little bit early. It just depends how things fall into place this year. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control over that. As you know, there's government, uh, there's investors and other people that we need to consider. Question on the batteries. Probably a good guide for the batteries and battery prices are diving. Um, but if you assume about $200, $250 a kilowatt hour. So 30, that gives you a price for a 30 kilowatt battery. Now that doesn't include the management system and depends on what, how sophisticated you want the system. And then Tenesis, I have I said that right? Are you discussing engagement with any virtual power plant operators? Uh, question is yes. We're in good discussions. And that's a good question, actually. Um, any of you who are in Adelaide, I want to do a trip to Adelaide, we'll be having driving our, our cargo out for a, a big event, June the 9th, breakfast event uh, at Lot 14, which is um, in Adelaide itself, where the old Adelaide Hospital was. It's being converted. Uh, and just look out for announcements on LinkedIn. Uh, and if you're on... Um, on our website as a subscriber, you'll get that information as well. Yeah, Chris, I'll see if I can dig some other pictures out, but if you go onto our website, you'll see all the vehicle pictures there. How many vehicles have you manufactured and sold and what are the projections for the next few years? That's a good question, Rob. Very easy to answer. We manufactured our first vehicle or assembled our first vehicle in March 2019. And um, we haven't manufactured any more at this stage. We're setting up manufacturing next year. Uh, the $5 million grant that we got from the federal government for our smart energy management system that I've been talking about that uh, manages the energy flow to and fro from the vehicle. Uh, we've got two vehicles coming into Melbourne. They'll be aggregated with the technology, or technology will be aggregated in them and tested and demonstrated to the Australian Energy Market Commission and some of the politicians. Then toward the end of this year at Tonsley, uh, the other 15 vehicles will be assembled and they'll go out to trial. So if there's anyone in the audience that's keen to trial their vehicle, happy to have them involved. Um, again, the best way to do it is subscribe on our website and then just send through a note saying, yes, Greg, uh, be, be keen to learn more. And the projections for the vehicles uh, next year, we've, Got a limit on the number we're manufacturing, there's 300. And so those people who reserve this year, they'll be first in the queue. And from that, we expect the numbers to escalate. Uh, we're predicting up to 55,000 by 2025, 20, 26, and 70% of those will be export. And they'll go offshore as what we call a smart pack. 
uh, where they're assembled overseas. Oh, oh, that. And the electric car Australia's made a point. He said he charges at home 90% of the time anyway. So there you go. Getting a few questions here. Sorry if I'm missing any. Can an extra portable battery be easily added for long range drive needs? A couple of ways of doing that. Um, we've got what we call a range extender, which can be a capacitor storage system, which is lighter. Um, but no, there's no issue putting batteries and probably one of the ways you could really get a range extension is a trailer with wheels and a battery uh, in the base of the trailer. Uh, efficiency of the motors compared with Tesla's. Well, our motors are Taiwanese. Tesla's motors were originally designed in Taiwan, so uh, we're not going to say we're exactly as good as a Tesla, uh, but we're pretty close. And electric motors, as you know, all over 90% efficiency and many up around 96% compared to your petrol engine, which is around 24. And um, Catherine McDonald says no pressure. Well, Catherine McDonald's the one that we've got to get the vehicle ready for in, in uh, October, November, no, October. How big a role do you see UVs playing in support stabilising the grid over the long term? Critical. In fact, um, the beauty of EVs going into the grid, it means you can do away with um, transmission over long power lines. You start looking at microgrids and you start looking at aggregating the storage in communities. And if you've got a thousand EVs you know, with a, a 30 kilowatt hour battery, that's 30 megawatts of energy uh, that can be moved around to stabilise the local community and provide grid services. And part of the grid services that the vehicle can provide is um, FCAS, which is frequency control, which is pretty important in uh, protecting equipment that's on the grid. Now, Ian's got another question. Sure, uh, how are you rolling out mechanical repair data and service centres? Like with the first Tesla, no. What's happening is uh, you won't be able to mail them back. Australia Post's not that good. Um, what we'll do is we've already got agreements in place with uh, motor trades associations and others, and um, they'll go through an endorsement, training endorsement, uh, with their auto electricians mainly because the vehicle is all electrical. Um, so you should be able to effectively. I can't release the details at the moment, still in confidence, but uh, by the time the vehicles are out, we'll have outlets where you can take your vehicle if need be. But keep in mind, it's not a fossil fuel vehicle, it's not a petrol vehicle, very few moving parts, and it'll probably need as much maintenance as the ceiling fan in your house. A uh, question about tow bars, not an issue. Uh, they can be fitted to the vehicle. Well, I've got some good questions here anyway, Alan. That's great. Yeah, if I could just... Ah, uh, here's another one there. And Andy Baker. Did you consider Did you? using... Yep. Uh, well, we haven't had any uh, real um, communication from CSIRO, but we'd consider, we consider anything. Um, uh, we've uh, And our focus has been, uh, and it is, we've got a global team working on this, and um, they're passionate for Australia. And uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, gives me a lot of satisfaction, you know, because it's been a hard job getting to this point. But there are a lot of people on the same page with passion for the future, passion for the environment, and uh, passion for what we can do in Australia. In fact, we've got quite a few people who are offshore that are reshoring to Australia, and some are even taking out Australian citizenship. Can you outline the energy management side of the business and vehicles? A yeah, pretty simple anonymous attendee uh, that arrived late. It's um, effectively a brain in the vehicle that talks with the grid and the grid tells it there's issues and the vehicle says, well, how can I help? Uh, you have control of the vehicle. No one else controls your vehicle. Uh, you can set it like, your, effectively set it like a mobile phone. You can say, no, I don't want any more than 20% of my battery being uh, used. And if you use it, I want 20 cents a kilowatt hour at least. Um, 
But those all those parameters can be set. And what we're doing, if you keep an eye on our trial this year, uh, and some of the media around the, the $5 billion grant from the federal government, you'll see that we're providing a, a very solid grid resilience capability. Um, Eckhart, how much of an edge do you think the composite material is over conventional metal? Well, Eckhart, that's a really easy question to answer, and that's why Boeing Dreamliner went from aluminium. Um, it's the weight and the strength, and you combine that with uh, the carbon uh, fibre, and uh, you've, got, you've got a winner. Now, what we have, we've got three key features that our vehicle has that are global advantages. One is the smart energy management system, which we're working on with a $5 million grant. The other one is our smart cell manufacturing capability, which is, has been developed by Gerhardt and Charles. It effectively means that we can produce a vehicle around one third the energy footprint of a traditional vehicle. Uh, and on top of that, up to 50% lighter. Each of those things are critical in electric vehicles because you want most of your energy used in transport rather than trying to lug something heavy around. Safety features. Good question, Mark. Um, the safety features of the vehicle, same as what you expect in other vehicles now. And in fact, you'll have more because you'll have all the uh, intelligence, um, crash avoidance systems and so on. But they have the vehicles that we've got going into trial, um, what we call a pre-prototype um, transformer vehicles. They've got airbags and all the safety devices. So ANCAP 5, yeah. one, of the, one of the rating level. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, batteries. Where are they? You, you didn't have the slide, but can you just give us an idea of roughly where in the centre related, uh, related yeah, well, to centre gravity they are? Yeah. Look, the battery pack, it's an armoured battery pack, which is a, is a requirement uh, 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 offshore, and it's got drop resistance, explosion resistance, and impact resistance. And it actually sits um, partly under the seat and under the cargo area of the vehicle. It drops out from below. And um, uh, it's roughly, if you want to give it a better size, around, around about 800 by 800 and 15 centimetres deep. It's actually, it's a major part of the weight of the vehicle. It's 225 kilo for the 30 kilowatt, kilowatt hour pack. But the advantage of having the battery pack there is side impact, you protect it. Uh, and because the battery is at such a low, the low center of gravity, uh, the rolling, the chance of the vehicle rolling over are much, much reduced to your, your um, fossil fuel vehicles. Yeah, and do you do things like crash tests? You go through the, yes. the whole yeah. gamut. Yeah. If, if you have a look at our website, you can see there's already cra crash tests were done in 2015, and then an other follow-up to crash tests with the side, I think it's a side impact with poles, was a new rule that came in that was done in April 2019. But um, all the vehicles will be going through another series of crash tests because we're just modifying some of them. So. Uh, and the safety is the critical thing with the vehicle. And our vehicle <laughs> is the protective cage when it makes it very safe. Uh, now the, the drivetrain, can you just explain what's, what the components of the drivetrain are besides the, or is it just the motor and uh, CV joints on driven wheels? Well, well effectively in our, in our series three, the current vehicles that are on our website, uh, the, the motor is located between the two rear wheels and basically we've got a, um, a gearbox, very simple ge gearing. And um, uh, if you want to compare it to anything, I guess it's a little bit more complex than the slot cars you and I might have played with when we were uh, teenagers, you know, raced around the track. And, but the, the, the actual drivetrain is um, it's Taiwanese. Okay, and Ian's asked to assume your vehicle's a two-wheel drive. Yeah, the, 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 this current series are two-wheel drive. Um, the Series 4 
Uh, we're looking at four wheel drive and all sorts of some clever variations. In fact, the Transformer series um, is quite exciting for us because uh, it can be a ute, it can be a, a, a cargo van, it can be an ambulance, it can be a minibus uh, or a refrigerated van. And about, it takes about 15 minutes to convert. Uh, another one from Mark to connect vehicle to home, what electrical work or equipment is, is needed? So, so I missed that one. I better check Mark. Yep. To connect vehicle to home, what electrical work or equipment is needed? A PowerPoint. And what our vehicle does, let's say I went around to your house, Mark, and plugged my vehicle in. Before it did anything, and once it plugged, put the plug in, they do an analysis of your, your circuit. So, yep, the circuit's okay. And if you then, the vehicle started charging or discharging, depending what the, the grid wanted at that stage. Um, uh, because it, the, the, the um, and, and turned your air conditioner or something else on, the vehicle will drop back so it's not heating up your wires. That's sort of a simple explanation. It's a bit more complex than that. And uh, Robin, hydrogen vehicles on your radar. Robin, they would be on the radar if it were hydrogen was able to be produced uh, with the same energy levels that uh, currently you get by direct solar and wind um, into batteries. Um, hydrogen, to me, hydrogen great is great in that it burns to water. Um, but um, it's the actual way you produce the hydrogen, hydrogen that has the main problem. There's a big issue. It's all tied around thermodynamics, and the uh, difficulty in splitting atoms. So hydrogen is not on our radar uh, at all. Would you say hydrogen is more realistic for large vehicles, um, railway locomotives, trucks? Look, I was at the Smart Energy Council this week. Um, earlier, earlier this week, no, last week, sorry. Uh, and um, uh, the, the most comforting thing there was that with the hydrogen events they had running, the, the rule they wanted to cut, see come in was that all hydrogen, if it's going to be used, has to be green hydrogen. Now, if it's green hydrogen, it's okay. If it's derived from fossil fuel, very, very expensive. In fact, it takes more fossil fuel to produce hydrogen and drive a vehicle than if you just put the vehicle, fill the vehicle with fossil fuel and drive it. So that hydrogen that isn't green is a threat to climate change, threat to pollution. Uh, it's a great business model for fossil fuel because they need to use more fossil fuel to produce the hydrogen. They look very green at the end of it. The cities will look nice and green because you'll be running hydrogen in the cities, but it's all the damage that's occurring elsewhere and outside that's a problem. And unfortunately, we're all on one planet. And to bring it into perspective, our planet, if you shrink it to the size of a basketball, one cup of water represents the oceans. Those oceans have been helping us out. They've been absorbing CO2. They're the things that keep our living conditions comfortable on this earth. And if we mistreat the world and keep burning fossil fuels, we're going to change conditions on this planet and they're not going to be real suitable for us. And that's part of the passion why I'm working on these electric vehicles because they're taking that out of the equation. I mean, you collect your energy from the best nuclear device in the world. It's up in the sky, the sun, and you convert it to electricity and drive your vehicle. Popular figures turned around for um, uh, batteries powered from uh, solar, um, the round trip efficiency of a, uh, a PV system of batteries is around 85%, but a uh, PV system producing green hydrogen, storing it and then converting it back to electricity is, um, I've heard less than 50%. I don't know if you've got any more accurate figures or better thought out figures. Uh no, I have. I, I wouldn't want to quote them off the top of my head, but the efficiencies are the, the, the efficiencies are the main thing. 
if we're going to be true to ourselves and realistic, whatever we do in the future needs to be more energy efficient and not just doing something and wasting energy to get there. And, uh, you know, and at the moment, there's 120 million tonnes of hydrogen created annually. Two thirds of that goes into ammonia for fertiliser. And that fertiliser then gets um, subsidies. It's a great business model for fossil fuel because it uses so much more fossil fuel to produce hydrogen. Mm, yeah. In, my, in my, my way of thinking, they've been, you know, it's good business. You invent a new way of using a product and uh, to turn fossil fuel into hydrogen is a new way. Yes, well, it is all the way of um, uh, keeping keeping coal and gas going. Um, but I said, if, if, if there is a real push, and it has to be from government, it's almost got to be a regulation. You produce hydrogen, it has to be green. Then we'll help you out with subsidies and whatever else. A couple more questions. One, Stuart, what's the seating capacity of the urban? And if it's less than five, do you have any plans for a family type car? Yep, yeah, good, good question. Um, Stuart, the um, seating capacity of the urban, you wouldn't want five adults. It's okay for sort of two adults and three children, and it's designed that way. It's not that we have bigger vehicles coming along, but we're actually in a specific area of the market. We're not interested really in competing with the Teslas and the, the BYDs and the S SUVs. You know, our focus is the smaller vehicle, last mile delivery, energy efficient, economical, um, long life, and of course, our main markets are offshore, not just Australia. But I can tell you, and I can't show you anything at the moment, but we do have a sports car and it looks pretty good. It's been designed in uh, Switzerland. Uh, carbon footprint for manufacturing of vehicles comparative to ICE vehicles. Uh, good question, Anonymous. I can't give you an exact figure, but it's a lot less. In fact, our factory. Uh, will be, well, I can give you some good figures, <laughs> our vehicle, uh, to manufacture a vehicle uh, with a smart manufacturing cell, it's one third the energy footprint. So that's the first bit. And our factories are actually going to be run on green energy. That sort of leads on to a question I had about employment prospects, which is always what uh, MPs will ask you when um, you go to them with an idea. Can you run us through the, the manufacturing cycle a bit and give us a, an idea of how much can be automated and what we could expect uh, semi-skilled and skilled labour requirements would be? Yep. The, the, the factory, when you walk into it, it'll be a bit more like a photocopy shop than anything else. Um, but you'll still need people working in the photocopiers. And we're calculating at the moment that it's about uh, one person for every 60 vehicles manufactured. So we would anticipate that if we're doing 55,000 units a year, you're going to be up over a thousand people working in a business. Now, of course, they won't all be on the factory floor. There'll be sales, retail, and um, all the other bits and pieces as well. Wrappers, uh, when I say wrappers, not the musical wrappers, we wrap our vehicles in a, uh, a, coat, a plastic coat and Yeah, so you know the, the job prospects are good, and there's a lot and a lot of other jobs that will feed into it. You know, into, you know supply chain with the various things that we're doing. And three uh, D printing would that be of any any relevance? Yes, that'll be that'll be pretty relevant with components, and perhaps down the track, uh, it could be even used with the um, printing the skeleton. But at the moment, as I said, it's made of 14 bones, chemically welded. Uh, we're getting close. There's some very big 3D printers around, but it won't be our first step. Okay, one from Andrew here, comment. Yeah, look, Andrew, I can tell you this, that uh, with our AC, 
bi-directional charges. AC is naturally cheaper, and you're probably looking around about a third the price, but don't hold me to it. Okay, the, the board is currently empty. Um, don't think I'm missing anyone on the... I think you've done pretty line. good. Yeah. Look, if that is all, that's been a, uh, we've been on, on the air for an hour and uh, that's been a terrific presentation. Um, Greg, it's... My pleasure. It's, it's been very... Uh, good questions. Positive. Yeah, it's, it's been a really positive account of what's happening and um, uh, and the, the potential of EVs and the uh, their relevance to uh, to our charging infrastructure um, to uh, the distribution grid. Um, and, look, and Alan, just I yeah. can fill some words in there for it. Just the lifestyle. Yeah, there'll be the, the day will come when Catherine, when she's taking delivery of her vehicle, she'll be at a barbecue. I say, "Oh, how's your vehicle?" And she say, "Well." I got my spare cash. I'm going on a holiday this year because it's only costing me, you know, ten dollars a week. Uh, whereas all the others that are barbecue, it's costing them fifty dollars a week. The fossil fuel vehicle. Yeah, and uh, there's, there's so much discussion at present about uh, oversupply of renewable energy in uh, South Australia, at least, and what can we do with it? Um, Electric vehicles are the solution. It's silly turning power off. I mean, you've generated the power, produced the energy, you may as well store as much of it as you can. Hmm. And then, of course, there's the option, uh, if there's a huge amounts of excess, you can start producing green hydrogen. Uh, there's been a few questions come up. Um, I think Andrew heard, so I'm seeing that as a marketing advantage for it, for, um, Grace, electric car. Thanks, Greg, for a great intro. intro. And um, and Bob and Jill. Yeah. Uh, yep. Any anyone that does anything in Australia, we'll talk to. We're very keen to be as Australian as possible. And just sometimes we're limited. And thanks everyone for your support and, and encouragement. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you again, Greg. Uh, I think we're at the uh, very end of the, the questions and uh, thanks to David Watton who has um, con managed the uh, Zoom webinar and uh, thanks for everyone for your interest and polite questions. So for more information about uh, uh, ACV, check ace-ev.com.au and for more information about Renew, check renew.org.au. And uh, our next Renew um, Adelaide branch next meeting will be on the 16th of August in um, either online or in person. Um, and I hope to see you then. So, Greg, if you just uh, stay will. for a couple of Thank minutes. You. Thanks, Alan. David, good evening. Thank you all for your attendance and good night.